Control System Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or ICSISAC. My name is Debbie Wendell, and I will be moderating and facilitating today's session. I serve as Community Director for the Center and oversee the Center's human-to-human -human information dissemination mechanisms. The fundamental mission of the ICSISAC is to provide a forum for communicating knowledge to improve the safety and security of cyber-physical systems. We perform this mission by providing real-time knowledge feeds and analytics to our members, fostering communities of interest which collaboratively share information, as well as by sharing examples of solutions which asset owners and their partners can use to improve their situational awareness. Next slide, please. The ICS ISAC views situational awareness through the prism of SARA, the Situational Awareness Reference Architecture. This solution briefing series offers valuable insight into available solutions that provide capabilities which may improve visibility into and control of inventory and activity while enabling asset owners to more effectively apply knowledge shared with them by external parties. Today's solution briefing provides an example of technical capabilities which can be used by asset owners to improve the situational awareness of their operational systems. While the ICS ISAC does not endorse specific products or services, we believe that the solutions discussed during this briefing include viable examples of available technical approaches that asset owners may consider utilizing in their environments. Again, the ICS ISAC does not endorse individual commercial solutions. However, we encourage asset owners to, con to consider the capabilities discussed today and consider seeking solutions which are appropriate for their environments. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Today's briefing, How to Leverage the Internet of Things to Your Organization's Advantage, features Francis Chinfroca, founder of and CEO at Bayshore Networks. During today's presentation, Francis will take the first few minutes to lay some background information to frame the issue, and then he'll spend about 30 minutes to present Bayshore Network solutions. Finally, there'll be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So, at any point during the call, you may go ahead and type your question into the chat box in the GoToWebinar application. After the meeting, a recording of this session will be available on the Center's website. So now, without any further delay, Francis, over to you for your solution briefing. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Uh, appreciate everyone's attention, and I uh, hope you're all having a good day. So what I wanted to do, really, with this presentation is to talk about some of the things that we've encountered at Tales of the Crypt kind of a story in dealing with Internet of Things, uh, industrial automation and control, and the cybersecurity uh, and safety issues around it. Now, we are going to talk about some of our technologies at Bayshore Networks, but that's not really the focus. What I wanted to do is to present some generalized information that I hope will be of use uh, to, uh, to security practitioners. And the, the focus really is uh, people who are knowledgeable about security issues, knowledgeable about cybersecurity practice, whether in industry or government policymakers, asset owners or vendors, uh, and to, to give a survey of the landscape as things stand here, we're speaking in late 2014, um, and tangentially talk about some of the solutions that we've developed. Uh, we're not going to get into too much specifics about that, but the point is just to give a survey uh, of the state of play. And I, I, we, we talk about just so stories because there's a tremendous amount of hype when people talk about the Internet of Things, uh, and Gartner just recently uh, stated that the top of the hype curve has been reached for the Internet of Things, which means we can now start thinking about real solutions and, and real business value generated uh, uh, in, in this space. But again, there's a lot of hype, a lot of, I won't say misinformation, but a lot of misconception. Um, around the, the, the security issues, and that's part of what we wanted to clear up a little bit today. So just uh, having said all that, I'm going to actually recapitulate a little bit of the hype, and some of this is quite interesting, actually. Uh, you may have, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard that the Internet of Things is this enormous coming thing, and Professor, Professor Tom Lee at Stanford says there will be a trillion things connected to the Internet within two decades. Well, that's pretty amazing. That's that's quite amazing. That's more than that's between one and two hundred things for every person on Earth. Okay.
Okay, so that would be an enormous change from where we are now and quite a spectacular vision. Even if over the next one, two, three, five, ten years, uh, which is really our focus for cybersecurity practice as well as business development, uh, it, it, we're still looking for a major transformation in just how things get connected to the Internet that are not people, computers, and smartphones and tablets. Okay. Um, I like the uh, the statement that uh, uh, that a that Hong Li Hong from Gartner makes here in the beginning. A lot of the marketplace will be focused on adding sensors to things and connecting them to the internet. That's a pretty important statement. That really encapsulates, in my view, uh, and our view here at Bayshore Networks, uh, what the early going is going to be like. And I'm going to get into considerably more detail about how that splits out. I wanted to call out a couple of companies in the industry that are very focused on IoT, very forward-looking. One of them is General Electric, uh, and they're, they're a company that has made it, you know, obviously everyone knows who they are, everyone knows the things that they do, um, one of the most successful and important com companies in American business. But the, the approach that they're taking to information sharing among their products uh, uh, on IP-based networks is quite remarkable. They are seeing business opportunities pretty much everywhere in that space. Very, very forward-looking company. Watch them. They will be leaders in the space. And another company I want to call out is Cisco. Uh, Cisco, they, they uh, <laughs> a little bit notoriously, uh, Mr. Chambers, their CEO, uh, got himself quoted uh, to Wall Street analysts stating that the Internet of Things uh, soon enough will be a 19 trillion dollar market with a T, trillion with a T. And, and, and since that's larger than the entire GDP of the United States, uh, I, I got to figure that you know Mr. Chambers knows something the rest of us don't. But uh, be that as it may, uh, they are making a commitment to providing the networking and the services, and they're doing so in a, I would say uh, a more forward-looking way than other networking companies. So pay attention to them as well. Um, Okay, so this is standard stuff, machine to machine communication and market projections. You know, uh, this is going to be in the in the slides if anyone wants to you know read through this. I'm not going to spend any time on this page, but you know, this is some of the stuff that various some of the numbers, uh, uh, dollar figures that some of the research firms are coming out with. I figure it's going to be uh, it's going to be big. Okay, so you know whatever the specific numbers are, they're going to be pretty meaningful. All right, so I wanted to get into some vocabulary before we set this up and really get into some more of the, of the meat. Um, I, and this is, again, by way of clearing away some of the hype, okay? Really identifying the terms that we're going to use so that it's not just all about Internet of Things as this amazing thing that's going to change everything, but nobody really is clear about how to do it. Our point here is to try to approach some of that clarity. Okay? When we talk about M to M, that's machine to machine communications. And to me, that's really the hallmark of the inter Internet of Things. It's machines sharing information on IP based networks, uh, be they the Internet or Ethernet. Okay? So that's the really new thing. You think about you know, how people use computers, networked computers, and endpoints like smartphones and tablets and desktop computers, as well as big servers and big applications resident in the cloud. Okay? Those applications, even though they're highly automated, they still have people driving them. Okay? The ultimate user of a computer application in the traditional sense is a person. As soon as you have machines talking to each other, you're adding an, an element to that that changes everything in terms of how the applications are constructed and how they're secured. And we're going to get into a little bit of detail on that. That's a big subject, too big for a short webinar. But that's something we want to at least give you a taste for. People talk about IOE. That's the Internet of Everything. That's really kind of a Cisco marketing buzzword. Uh, Internet of Things, if you're going to use a term, that's the one I prefer. We talk a lot about ITOT convergence. We'll get into this a bit more in detail. But organizations, enterprises, policymakers, governments, uh, asset owners that are involved in machine-to-machine -machine communications as a rule, they're going to have IT organizations, traditional IT, uh, and with more or less capabilities in terms of uh, security, cybersecurity, and protection for, for for enterprise applications. And they have organ 
Operational technology, OT, production zones, that's where the machines are. Okay, a key feature of, of IoT that you all need to be aware of and watch is the convergence between the IT and the OT people within your organizations or across organizations. They speak different languages. They have a different culture. In many cases, they don't trust each other very much. Okay? The need for convergence and an increase in trust and an increase in sharing of responsibilities and learning each other's you know, business to some extent is essential for success. This is not a technical problem. It's a political and an organizational problem. Okay, keep it front and center because it's going to it's going to be a determinant of, of success in your organization. All right, we talk about the industrial internet. That's a term that GE tends to use uh, as a synonym for IoT. They're thinking about machines talking in uh, industrial applications, so that's kind of a focus for them you know, as a major capital goods vendor. Uh, we talk about factories of the future, and now. What I mean by that is, okay, think about uh, think about Internet of Things. What you know, I, I've already said, stress on machine-to-machine -machine communications over Ethernet and IP-based networks, right? Extending that another way, it's talking. You know, you're, you're really talking about extending the reach of telemetry and control signals. Okay, that's a key point. You know, we, to avoid getting sucked into hype and you know, really understanding what this is about, that's that's what this is about. We're talking about extending the reach of control signals and telemetry to and from machines. Okay, so that means that a lot of the low-hanging fruit early applications are going to be around sensors. I mentioned a couple of slides back, uh, the Gardner analyst who says that uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff is about adding adding sensors to devices and uh, and networking the information from the sensors. That's an important point. Okay, when you add, so that that's what I mean by extending the reach of telemetry. Okay, it produces applications like predictive maintenance and zero downtime and big data analytics. Right, all very good stuff. The factory of the future is really about realizing the promise of extending of the control signals part of that. We're thinking in terms of uh, factories that can self-organize, where the capital equipment, the equipment inside the factory, is, is, is uh, uh, more knowledgeable and capable and flexible. And that's, gonna, that's about, uh, you, you need policy frameworks that can capture the uh, the operations of process control and entire factories and entire manufacturing uh, 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 ex geographically diverse systems like oil and gas exploration. So that's a new thing that's coming. That's a little farther out. Okay, that's not the immediate thing. All right, but I think of it's a, it's going to be a revolution just like the the first wave of automation back in the early 80s. And I'm old enough to remember in the early 80s when people first brought automation into factories and they were saying things like, oh boy, uh, now we don't have to over-provision the amount of fruit juice that we put into a food product to meet our you know, advertising claims because we can measure precisely and save a whole lot of money doing that. And of course, the early 80s was the time when industrial, when automotive assembly robots were invented. Okay, With Factory of the Future, it's going to be a revolution of exactly the same uh, depth, possibly more even a greater reach. When I talk about information sharing, okay, this is really referring to the problem uh, that, that policymakers, particularly at the federal level, have in providing for cybersecurity. Okay? How do you uh, share threat intelligence and knowledge about problems in, in cyberspace with uh, important constituents? perhaps the DIB companies, the members of the defense industrial base, and with other industrial companies who really need to know uh, the latest, uh, which is very sensitive information, and it's a major problem. Uh, it's been a legislative problem and a political problem, and I, I hope that there are some policymakers listening to, to me, uh, and I hope you don't take a miss, but it, from my view on an industry, this is an unsolved problem that still needs a considerable amount of work. Okay, so running ahead. Um, very, very quickly, just to identify some of the sectors, broad sectors across industry, where you're seeing a lot of activity currently in in Internet of Things, you know, moving machines to the Internet, uh, or not, you know, not just the Internet, but also 
moving machine communications to Ethernet and IP-based networks, whether or not they're on the Internet. Okay, Manufacturing, both discrete manufacturing and process manufacturing, that's a key one where a lot is going on right now. There's a great deal of interest in oil and gas, uh, both the upstream and the downstream. Uh, upstream mostly because there's very, very little security in uh, exploration systems. Think about wellheads uh, that are communicating by satellite. Um, almost no security there. That's an important area. And the downstream, uh, that's refineries and pipelines, of course, uh, and they're under tremendous amount of regulatory pressure to come into compliance with cybersecurity norms. Power systems, another major area. Uh, this is not, people talk about the smart grid, which is where a lot of, uh, of work that is recognizably Internet of Things has already taken place, but I'm actually more thinking about the distribution and transmission parts. Uh, of the power grid where there are uh, electronic systems in place uh, that need more cybersecurity than they currently have. Okay, uh, so moving on. I always like to make a distinction, a clear distinction in where, how the IoT splits out, and, and the, the, the point here with this, this, uh, uh, with this discussion is where is the activity today where is it going to be next, and where is it going to be after that? Okay, so the current major amount of activity, uh, just a hotbed, I, everybody's doing this, is on the industrial automation and control side. Okay, that would be closed domains, places where traditionally you have, uh, you're running protocols like Ethernet IP and Modbus and DNP3 and SCADA protocols, typically closed domains not shared uh, outside of their own uh, production zones, not even with their own IT organizations, much less with other companies. Um, and the, there's a great movement, and I'll get into this in a bit more detail, but great movement from traditional serial bus-based networking to Ethernet networking. Okay, so there's a lot going on with uh, IoT work there. That's happening right now. Okay. The next thing is product safety, and this is what I tend to call, when we talk about Internet of Things, this is usually what I mean. That's, gonna, that's a little bit farther out, perhaps a year or two away from really uh, hitting in a big way, which of course means that if you're in a big company, if you're in a big organization now, anything that's going to happen a year or two from now, you're working on today. Okay? And, and, and this is uh, the idea of large industrial products that are sold to sophisticated customers or asset owners and governments having safety systems and security systems built into them such that their control signals and telemetry can't be compromised, aren't subject to attacks of the general class of Stuxnet. Okay, and, and, and that involves, you know, the, what distinguishes this from the industrial automation control realm is open domains. Okay. Communications, network communications are going, to trans, uh, are going to transcend boundaries of specific production zones. They're going to cross over into the IT realm, and they're potentially going to cross over the Internet uh, with appropriate security to partners and, and, and clients. Okay. That's a major, major move, and there's a lot different about it, whereas industrial automation control is basically putting in additional stuff like sensors and networking to processes and infrastructure that already exists. On the product safety side, we're talking about new capabilities that are being added to capital goods like jet engines and turbines and pressure vessels and wellhead equipment. Okay, All that stuff is acquiring a certain amount of computing capability and networking capability, which is going to enable a lot of new applications and a lot of new business value but also at the same time a lot of security issues. Okay. And the third one is the consumer Internet of Things. This is where most of the hype is, and I'm not going to talk about it too much. This is, you know, your refrigerator sending a tweet to the grocery store saying, I ran out of milk, send me some more. Okay, I'm not, that's, that's a, there's some interesting challenges there, but I think that's where most of the hype is and most of the misconceptions. So, but. Again, uh, the, the things that are happening right now are industrial automation and control and coming very soon, the product safety. So those are the things to really focus on. Okay, connected machines. And I'm going to wa I'm watching my time here. So what do machines actually say to each other? Now, this is mostly in the, the factory floor, 
uh, oil field, uh, building automation kind of realm, right? Traditional infrastructure, machines that you would recognize, conveyor belts, paint machines, robots, uh, uh, pressure vessels, et cetera, et cetera, you know, water pumps. When you're going to be moving those machines over to Internet of Things, what do they say to each other? It's machine-to-machine -machine communications, right? Largely what they say is, I'm here. I'm doing this. My pressure or pressure or temperature or speed or position is this. We're talking about sensors and actuators. Okay? What you're seeing in many, many companies is a movement from the older kinds of serial bus-based networking, like device net and CAN bus, to Ethernet. If you're an IT person listening to this conversation, it's not the kind of Ethernet you're aware of, you're, 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 you're used to from, from the IT environments, okay? The connectors are different. You know, rather than RJ45 connectors, you see M12 and M18 connectors that are waterproof and IP67 compliant. The switches look different, okay? They're waterproof and oilproof and shockproof, and they come from, you know, uh, Cisco just has a brand new offering in this space, but they have not been a player. You'll see switches for people like Hirschman uh, and, and companies like that. So a lot of the Ethernet networking for factory floor is very different. Okay, you see, and, and this is a can't overemphasize this. When you're talking about networking for for industrial applications, things like latency and jitter are far more important than bandwidth because they completely mess up how machines work. All right, so one of the problems, one of the hype areas is that networking companies and you know, networking vendors and networking technologies can be brought to bear on industrial networking in a seamless, easy transition from you know, using standard technologies, standard products, standard vendor relationships, and standard uh, 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 support mechanisms right, from IT. Not going to work that way. Okay, you'll be amazed when you find out the ways that even though machines are talking with over Ethernet, the ways that they can mess each other up and take each other offline when they're seeing completely normal and standard stuff that you'll find in an IT Ethernet is, is amazing. Okay, and I could do a whole presentation on that, but that's something to be aware of. Um, I talked about IT and OT convergence. This is where this comes in. All right, when people in in these uh, industrial automation and control realms, when they talk about adding machine-to-machine -machine communications, very often the, the, the opportunity, the opportunity is to connect some of those production zones to systems, databases, applications uh, that, are, uh, that are controlled by the IT part of the house. Those are already in place. All right, production, production management, ERP, those are often mainframe-based systems of long tenure. Okay, but we're talking about adding much more connectivity, much more uh, density and granularity of data from sensors, so that you can do things like predictive maintenance. Okay, and that's where that's where the interesting part comes. With convergence, you're going to get the IT people with their own mindset about security, and the OT people with their mindset, and Again, as I said before, how those two groups of people mesh, you know, whether you, it, that is going to determine success. Okay, they need to learn to trust each other, whereas in many places today they don't, and have good reasons not to. Okay, so that's a key barrier that has nothing to do with technology. Okay, now let me also point out a very key point, which is OT people. If you start talking to them about security like access controls and authentication and encryption and authorization and malware detection, they'll tell you things like, don't waste my time with any of that security crap. It's not my problem. I don't want to know about it. What I'm worried about is safety. I want to make sure that no, nobody can send my machines a control signal that's going to change how they behave in ways that, I, that are, are either unsafe or I can't control. Okay. So that's a different language and a different mindset. It's part of the OT convergence challenge. Okay. So let me let me run ahead. All right. When I'm talking about product safety, again, one of the things I want to call out here is, uh, and I won't say much about this right now, um, the protocols that you'll that you'll encounter 
are going to be completely different for product safety when, let's say, you're, you're an airline and you operate jet engines from companies like GE or Pratt & Whitney or Rolls-Royce, and uh, there, wa there wants to be some kind of information sharing, fine-grained, pretty dense information sharing, uh, so that your, uh, your, your you know, propulsion vendor can support your, your operations you know, in, a, in, a, in a more effective way, in a more efficient way. That's kind of the promise of IoT in that kind of a realm. Okay? So um, I mentioned before, in industrial automation and control, the protocols that people use to communicate machine to machine are very traditional, old-fashioned. If you're not in the space yourself, you've probably never heard of most of this stuff. Things like Modbus, uh, at, um, uh, even at IP, um, DNP3 for the electrical grid, IEC61850. You know, C37.118, very SCADA protocols of many, many different types. Okay, this is stuff that is generally comes out of the uh, serial bus world, very, very different in orientation, not much like the internet protocols at all. But that's what the communications look like, and some of that's going to migrate over uh, into IoT. With product safety, I think you're going to see a very different set of protocols, and they're also pretty unfamiliar. You know, when machines talk to machines over the internet for the new kinds of applications, a lot of that communication is going to run over HTTPS using REST applications. You're not going to see a whole lot of SOAP or web services because it's just too, it's just too much, too much bandwidth requirement for low power machines. Machines don't have a lot of bandwidth or or compute power. Okay, you're going to see protocols like XMPP used pretty extensively. You're going to see some newer things that you may not have heard of, like MQTT. And, and that's a lot of the stuff that's going to be different uh, about the, the upcoming Internet of Things. So um, I'm not going to say much about consumer applications at all, although this one, this one gets most of the attention. A lot of stories uh, are, are told about security problems relating to devices in your home or in your office that are going to have connectivity for various kinds of applications. And I think that the, the key point to make here is the provider. I, I, I'm, I'm going to predict that you're not going to see a major market with security products being, being sold directly to people who run you know, automation in their homes or offices or small businesses in the same way that people buy antivirus software. I don't think that's going to work out that way. I think the, it's enough of an esoteric practice area that you're going to see it provided by networking vendors. Okay, a couple of networking vendors, the big ones, you know, very major names, are going to make a business out of providing a security platform, uh, uh, and that's what's going to, that's how you're going to acquire security for the consumer, for the consumer IoT. Um, threat intelligence. Just want to say a bit about because this again is another area where cybersecurity for for machine communications is very different than it is for enterprise applications, standard computer apps. And it relates to the, 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 the nature of the, the opportunity for an attacker, okay? You're, not, you don't, you're gonna see very few so-called script kitties, okay? Relatively unsophisticated people who are just executing uh, uh, opportunistic attacks against enterprise apps, which is what you see constantly um, in, in, uh, in enterprise um, security. The thing is that if you're going to attack a machine, it generally has very restricted functionality. Okay, so you really need to know what you're doing. You need to you have, to have a pretty good idea of what that machine is, who made it, what model number it is, what its specific capabilities are in a given environment under attack, and then you know the the things that you can do to mess it up are relatively limited. Okay, so even though the attack surface overall is orders of magnitude larger than it is for enterprise IT. We're gonna, if, if it really turns out that we have a trillion devices connected to the internet in 20 years, right? Uh, it's a much, much larger service, but it's lumpier. It's much more granular, okay? And so that changes the nature of the threat pretty radically. Um, let me talk about, really quick, a real life use case. This is something that we've actually, we've, we've done here at Bayshore Networks uh, with uh, a, 
Cisco for a partner and a major manufacturing company that is a Fortune 10 company and a household name. Uh, this is just to give an example of something that's happening right now. Okay, this one is secure remote access. Okay, through the internet to an assembly robot that's running on a production zone. Okay, this is the kind of access that has never been allowed before. Okay, and let me tell you, well, I just, just describe briefly what we added here. This is, again, this is real stuff. This is stuff we did this year. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what's different about the security challenge, okay, because this should be illuminating as to what makes it different. All right, the goal is zero downtime. Okay, to enable zero downtime for an assembly robot, you need a whole lot more granular and up to, up to the minute, real-time information, or near real-time, diagnostic information about how that machine is behaving. Okay, so there's a, there's a number of security problems associated with this. First off, you know, if you're the, the, the owner of the, of the robot, there's stuff like how many machines, how many widgets you're making per hour that you don't want to transmit back to anybody, not even you know, your, your maintenance partner. Okay, you only want to transmit voltages, pressures, positions, uh, power usage, and things like that that you know can actually uh, uh, be useful for for zero for zero downtime and predictive maintenance. And you do want to transmit those up. The other thing you really don't want to do is ever allow any remote control signal to come in and change the behavior of the robot. The whole application needs to be read only, not read write. And the reason for that is very simple. It's a it's a safety it's a safety issue, uh, which is called line of sight, right? If you're going to change how any machine is behaving, the rule in manufacturing is you need to have your eyeballs on it, okay? That control signal cannot be executed remotely because what if there's a man standing next to it, okay? Robot swings its arm and takes his head off. That's, that's where the rule comes from. So what we did, uh, and this is using Bayshore Networks technology, because uh, what we do is content-aware inspection. All right, and that's an essential element going beyond plain old security, uh, plain old firewalling. So uh, we worked with our partners, Cisco. Cisco provided uh, the internet security elements, the ASA firewalling, and their new product called ICE, which handles uh, uh, authentication and authorization. And uh, a Bayshore device is in line with the network traffic from the external vendor down into the production zone. And after all of the, the security stuff has been done by the Cisco pieces, what the Bayshore piece adds is a safety and operational filtration, okay? We look at the, the protocol and we dissect it, we take it apart. In this case, it happens to be uh, a proprietary RPC. Remember, I mentioned that the protocols in, uh, in, in, in industry land are pretty frowsy and different. This one was pretty frowsy and different. But the point is that we analyze using a policy statement that says line of sight, enforce line of sight, write, uh, read but not write, uh, and only read certain things, certain registers off of the robot. Uh, and so our, our device was able or is able to enforce that kind of policy. And what we do is whenever a, an RPC transaction comes through, we inspect it, we figure out what kind it is. All right, is it, is it a write? If so, we drop it. Is it a read? Then we look at the context information we get from the Cisco equipment and say, uh, is that is the session allowed to see that, that diagnostic information? If so, then we transmit it through. Okay, so that was pretty good. Um, here's another one. This case is water pump. For instance, in a chemical plant or a process manufacturing plant. Okay, and we have a PLC which controls the set point for the water pump, and at the top we've got a control system which is probably an electronic control, possibly running on someone, an operator's PC or, or a tablet device, okay? And the, the nature of the control that we're adding, so security is fine. You know, you know all about the security problems that we have, you have to solve. You have to solve those, but there's a, a safety and operational policy which says don't ever allow the pumps to run great, at, at, a, at, a, at a rate higher than 49 liters per second. That requires filtration of the actual transactions being sent through the wire. That's a policy problem, not just a security problem. That's what I'm talking about when I say that policy is as important as, as security in, in IoT. Okay. How am I doing on time, Debbie? 
Debbie? You're good. I'm good. Okay, I'm watching my clock. Yep, I think I've got about five more minutes, right? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So, all right, uh, something I wanted to point out, and I, 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 I hinted at this earlier, uh, doing security for Internet of Things is different in a lot of different ways. Uh, you've heard some of them about the protocols. What I wanted to point out is that when you have people that are ultimately the consumers and the drivers of an information system, people are infinitely adaptable to exception conditions. Right? You pull up a web page and, and there's a broken GIF on it. You don't care. You, you can still get most of what you need off of that web page. If your email system hiccups, you'll just go back a minute later and try again. Okay? Machines do not have that, that kind of adaptability. That is the reason why, you know, the, the, the structural reason why you need safety and operational policy as part of the communications filtration, as part of the, the overall security technology that you add to make the IoT actually work. It's not just the standard security things like protecting IP addresses and ranges and ports and you know you dissect the protocol and you do a little bit of next gen firewalling. All that standard stuff has to be done but for industry because machines are so sensitive to inputs that they did not expect much 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 more sensitive than human operators are. Okay, You need to add in positive policy controls, mitigation controls that are going to ensure that machines can't be operated in an unsafe way. This is a very, very, very large area and it's going to be an essential part of, of making the IoT work. Let me show you what we have done at Bayshore uh, and I'm taking the liberty to show this to you because we're, uh, we, we, we've come up with, we created over time actually, a policy language that has the ability to capture the safety and operational constraints as well as the security constraints. And I'm taking the liberty of, of, of introducing it to you because we're open sourcing this. Okay, we're, we're releasing this technology uh, as an open technology that everyone in government uh, and industry can use to express policy constraints that go beyond uh, the security constraints that are familiar from IT. And, and just if you take a quick look at this, it may be a little hard to read. Uh, toward the bottom here, remember I told you about a about a robot control. Uh, we want it to be able to read from it but not write to it. That's what's being captured here, in this green box where I have a condition. The first the condition says SXP source tag. That refers to the Cisco security group tagging technology. Uh, so to say uh, that if a particular a particular transaction on the wire, okay, has is tagged number two, then we're going to take a look at, we're going to allow it as long as the RPC call number is not 161. And that's how we captured the idea, because 161 in this particular RPC language is a write transaction, changes what the robot does. All the other available transactions are reads, so we allow them. But only if the, the, uh, the endpoint communicating to the robot is properly authorized. Okay, so our policy language is called Palaton. We we call it that because you know our intent always was to open source it, and uh, Palaton is available in a variety of ways. We just recently packaged it up as an Apache module for people who want to use the Palaton language to control web applications. And I invite you, to, if you if you have an interest, I invite you to go look at modpalaton.org. Uh, which is a website we set up. You can register to get uh, to get a download, and we'll send you uh, we'll send you links so that you can uh, experiment with the Palaton language uh, as you as you wish. So just to summarize, the three key takeaways that I want to leave you with, and then I'll hand it back to Debbie. First, learn about the industrial protocols because they're the big thing that makes OT different from IT. If you're dealing with, if you're in an organization where you're concerned about industrial automation and control, that's going to be things like Modbus and Ethernet IP all right, and SCADA. Uh, you're also going to want to pay close attention to protocols like MQT, MQTT, XMPP, AMQP, the various lightweight protocols that are, in most cases, exist, have existed. They're, they're new, but they're not brand new, uh, but they're being adapted for machine communications because they feature uh, very lightweight on the wire. Think very hard about policy. The things that you know from IT security are important and essential but not enough. 
You also need to think about safety and operational policy, and new frameworks have yet to be developed and adopted industry-wide. Okay, that's why in, in, at Bayshore Networks, we're taking a leadership role in disseminating and identifying the need for those frameworks and putting out the technology so that it can be used freely. All right, industrial automation and control is the now opportunity. And Internet of Things and product safety coming very soon, and consumer internet applications coming a little bit beyond that. So that's pretty much my talk. And I'll, yeah, so with Bayshore Networks, very, very quickly about us, uh, we provide operational and security policy regulations. We provide technology, we provide network devices that incorporate our policy language and can be used to protect machines and machine communications. And we also have a security framework uh, that can be used in the cloud to protect, protect machine communications, as well as to do things like enterprise applications, like network DLP, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got a uh, very proud to name, well, I'm not going to name them, but uh, uh, anyone who's interested in talking to us, uh, we've got a number of Fortune 100 companies and governments and global NGOs uh, on our customer list that are using our technology. Um, so I think, Debbie, I'm going to pass it back to you. All right. Thanks, Francis. Appreciate that. Thank well, you, for your, thank so you great. for your attention. Yeah, lots of great background information there. And now we'll go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion of today's call. Remember that you can type your questions into the chat box there in the GoToWebinar application. And we'll give folks another couple minutes to type in their questions. I do have a couple of them here and a comment as well that was entered. Um, you mentioned there towards the end of your presentation about the policies and um, talking to about the, the big data and the generation of large volumes of information. So I've got a couple questions that kind of go together. My, the, the first question would be, does the exponential increase in volumes of data that are being generated by so many additional sensors, you know, just this huge, massive reservoir of data, does that help or hinder overall situational awareness mm. at the enterprise level and then holistically looking across municipalities and, and, and the systems as a whole? So I want to toss that one to you first. Okay, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And I think that the, there's a, a lot of scope to really mess this one up. I think that a lot of organizations, notably policy organizations, have a great interest in internet weather Okay, situational awareness of their own, uh, their own uh, organizational uh, physical plant, their you know, machines, their factories, what, what have you, and also municipalities and federal government all right, for a lot of different applications. And yeah, uh, the, the information that is coming up off of these sensors is going to need to be filtered and it's going to need to be aggregated in ways that are going to make it meaningful. And we also believe that a huge part of this is application behavioral baselining. Now there is a lot of practice out there in you know, network anomaly detection. Um, we don't think that's going to be all that useful, all right? but we think that it's going to be a tremendous amount of value in uh, observing machine behaviors, um, both at the level of individual organizations and, uh, and the internet as a whole, and the technology doesn't, is probably applicable. A lot of the same technology you know, the, some of the big data techniques, you know, like unsupervised machine learning, uh, we believe, and we're working on this, are going to be very applicable to the problem of aggregating all this huge amount of data and making it actionable. But that's, that's the, that's, we're not there yet. That's mm -hmm. still some time away. And I know a lot of very, very sharp and sophisticated people are working on that problem. So uh, while the answer would, you know, th th top level, really quick, dumb answer, or a short answer to your question would be yes, absolutely. There's a lot of work to be done to actually make that real because yeah. you know, uh, too much data is too much noise. You know, you, you still have the, the uh, converting data to information problem, and, and that's not there yet. Right, right. So, so do you see a move more to a real-time analysis rather than a data mining of what's there? Uh, or wh where do you see that heading, or do you see any trend emerging? Uh, it's too early. I think that the, there's mm -hmm. many different classes of applications. When we, we talked about predictive maintenance, how machines are actually behaving mm -hmm. at the level of individual organizations. 
that is going to benefit from a lot of offline analysis, that, which then produces baselines that are going to be applicable to real-time data. That's not a very big problem in terms mm -hmm. of the size of the data. Okay? Mm -hmm. When you start to generalize that out to internet weather or, or you know, large-scale threat detection, then it becomes a big problem. But I do believe that there is a role for, and this is not new. I mean, you know, people are trying to do this already with with with, with network data and you know session metadata, communications metadata. Uh, but I think that uh, the the rise of machine communications is going to provide a, a fertile uh, environment for doing offline baselining applied to real time data. So the answer is both. Mm, okay. Um, thinking about some of the payment card breaches and thinking about um, data storage times and that sort from a, from an enterprise perspective, do you see setting policies and directives to limit the time frames of data storage to be advantageous on the industrial side, or do you see that more from a PII side and just kind of leave it over there? Um, it's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, you know, it's like what the, the what the essence of your question, what relates it to you know the, the broad opportunity is usage of resources in a more efficient way. Mm. Okay, I, I think that question, you know, even though you've got a, a massive privacy element to your question, it's also isomorphic to right. how do I how do I manage the delivery of electrical power such that it's provided when it's most needed. Right and mm -hmm. stored when it's not, like at night or you know when conditions aren't windy. Um, so I, it's a, it, it's all about data. I mean, if you can uh, if you can put data together from machines uh, and construct applications that um, will make it possible to to manage how how resources get resources get used. I think that's going to be very. That's an extremely mm -hmm. high level statement, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a whole lot of opportunities that are just, just that fit that with more or less detail, and it's going to be—you're going to be surprised. You're going to be amazed by how how many different industrial sectors and different companies come up with ways to uh, to create valuable applications of that form. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really answer your question uh, as it relates to pr storage of data uh, and privacy information. I think that's a different problem. I mean, the mm -hmm. whole problem of uh, PII and PHI, the health information, mm -hmm. uh, where that gets stored. Um, that's going to have to be dealt with by devices and machines like medical equipment, hospital mm -hmm. equipment, in-home patient care equipment uh, that generate that, 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 that data that has to be solved as part of delivering those applications. Now, it, it, if, you, if there's another question, I'll let you go on, but I just if not, I'd like to add one more little bit to that. Go ahead and add another bit, and I have a couple more questions too. So. Oh, okay. Um, I, off, I always get asked, we're going into a new technology area. IoT is a mm -hmm. new kind of technology, so what's the standard pattern? You, you build the applications and try to deliver the value. You don't think about security, and then you've got a big mess. Okay, That's the way, the, the standard pattern uh, for new technologies. I believe that with IoT, you're talking about adding electronic communications to the core business of it's not an application like email, which is ancillary to your core business. All right, if you build cars or you you know, you, you you drill for oil and gas, uh, you're talking about uh, adding machine communications to the stuff that really does your core business. And I believe that the large companies in, in various industries, and also companies that are subject to heavy regulation, mm -hmm. are not going to make that mistake this time. A lot of smaller companies might. And so that's where you're going to see a lot of problems, potential exposures of PII and PHI. Hmm. Very cool. Thank you. I have another question here about rules-based approaches. Mm -hmm. Rule-based approaches work well, but typically suffer from not being really manageable. Yep. What if there were hundreds of RTUs to be protected, mm -hmm. each with different DNP3 object addresses? Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that kind of volume of yeah. stuff? That's a core question. Uh, of course, a very perceptive question, and I would imagine that question was asked by someone who has direct experience. That's totally the question you're going to run into. There's a, a, another aspect to it as well, which is what happens when you change 
vendors, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you change uh, some of your control equipment, like from Schneider to Rockwell or something like that, mm -hmm. then net, you, not only are you changing the DMP control points, you might even change into a totally different protocol, mm -hmm. right? But the policy overall doesn't change, okay? So mm -hmm. uh, a core requirement for a policy framework, whether you think of it as rule-based or behavior-based, or if it has elements of both, um, is what I call multi-level. And we built this into our Peloton framework. And uh, you know, everyone listening is invited to, uh, to follow the links we gave and, and investigate what we've done with Peloton. Um, because again, we intend to offer it as an open standard. But Peloton allows you to create policy objects that are defined in terms of other policy objects. We call them meta controls. All right, so I can have a control uh, which I'm managing at a top level uh, that says, don't let the water pumps run over over 49 liters per second. In the, be, between that level of enforcement and the, the actual network device that reads the protocols, there's going to be a meta control, and there's going to be one for Rockwell equipment, one for Schneider equipment, one for Gould's pumps or whatever, mm -hmm. that are going to translate the top level control, which refers to a flow rate, into the specific machine commands uh, as they appear on the wire, which could be Modbus function points or DNP objects or whatever. And our, our vision is that operators and regulators are going to manage the top level policies. Vendors of capital equipment will manage the middle layers. Okay, So mm -hmm. you're going to get uh, from, you know, when you buy a new piece of, of control equipment, you're going to be able to download from the vendor or from a uh, third party or, or you know, open source support community the intermediate meta objects that are going to translate the top level policy into uh, the actual wire controls. That's an essential part of the story. Without that, you don't get scale. Very good. I think you answered the first part of the next question that I have, but would like you to touch on the second part. Here, here's the two part. Um, uh, Let's see, what industries uh, are already adopting IoT technologies, and I, you gave a, an example there. What protocols and applications are they running, and what obstacles are they facing? I think that's, that's a, a good place to expand on there, please. Okay, so in, I would say in, in, the, in, in the industrial automation control world, uh, the, the, the obstacles that you face are really about how to how to how to how to, how to control transactions and behaviors, all right, for the purposes of of enabling safety rather than security. And that really comes down to having control systems that have to be deployed in the network. We're not there's always going to be legacy infrastructure, okay? Uh, it's not plausible as some vendors do try to say uh, the next generation of equipment is going to be fully policy enabled and uh, have full uh, electronic security control. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. right? So I think one of the challenges is to apply proper security and safety policy to existing legacy infrastructure. And the way to do that pretty much is through network gateways. Okay, so I think that that's going to be the, uh, the, the short term answer. Uh, we are working on embedded solutions that are going to take our the Peloton policy language, actually run it on chips so that you can embed it directly into a, a machine. But that would be new generations of machines and everybody's still running the old ones. So I think that's one of the one of the key problems that you face. Um, I think that uh, the movement from field bus to Ethernet presents some interesting problems. And the, the biggest problem, and I've already touched on this, is uh, as soon as uh, Industrial networking starts to touch IT networking. All kinds of frowsy problems turn up that you just can't you can't anticipate. And uh, for you know you, you you need you need partners, technology partners that understand both the production side and the IT side. You're not going to get that from typical from the large vendors on either side of the equation. Okay, it's going to have to be a new generation of, of, uh, of technology partners uh, that, that understand both. So I, I felt like that was a, 
partial answer to the question. It's a, it's a pretty big question. We, it, well, these are complex issues. Yeah, there, right. there are no hard and fast answers. And just like the, the question that I tossed to you earlier, you know, there's going to be different enterprises that deal with different things different ways. I totally. Mean, it's it's Absolutely the nature right. of the business. They all have different risks. They all have different vulnerabilities. They all have different strengths. Well, they have different, uh, they all have different cultures and d different business drivers. Right. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And I did just drop another question into the to the chat box, and I sent it directly to you, Francis. I don't know if you want to read it real quick. It deals with specific uh, vulnerability and mitigation issues, um, so and setting up rules and protocols therein. So I'm going to give you a chance to yep. to look that over real quick, if you would, please. Okay, is this a private question or can I? Yeah, I dropped. Read I dropped it. To the, it to I dropped it. To, no, no. Go ahead and read it out to the group if you'd like. If you want to okay. address that one. All too. right. So this relates to. Okay, there's a, a OPC is one of these standard, widely used industrial protocols. I haven't mentioned it, but it's one of them. Um, and it was a fairly classic kind of. A, it was a buffer flow error. In other words, it, it's possible with certain kinds of equipment to feed a a protocol malformation that produced a machine misbehavior. There's all kinds of these. There are going to be thousands and thousands of these, okay, problems of this general class. So the way that you deal with it, okay, is pretty much, you know, in, in, in our approach to the world, as I said, you've got a security layer and you've got a safety layer above it. You need a policy enforcement framework that can handle both levels. I haven't emphasized that enough. All right, that, that's a key part of, uh, of the approach that we take here at Bayshore Networks. We think it's the right approach. So that means that uh, one of the things that we do all the time is let's say you're passing OPC through the wire. We're going to validate that all of the fields in the OPC are actually correct and do not uh, contain malformations and problems like a field length that's you know, specified incorrectly. You know, because you don't want to give, you don't want to give a, a PLC or a legacy machine that does support the protocol, but you don't want to give it a chance to misbehave. You want to block it with a network device that's filtering the communications. And the reason for that is, is quite simple, because you're not going to get a chance to replace the legacy equipment. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and even if you could, you're not going to be able to replace it with something that has enough compute power, uh, and certainly not an OS stack, because that induces all kinds of other vulnerabilities. right? Um, you don't want that machine to have too much smarts, okay? You want to move the smarts to a network gateway that can handle a great number of different machines at, at once and apply more sophisticated, deeper controls uh, uh, to the network flow, including problems like this. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's a adequate answer to the questioner. All right, fantastic. Anybody else? Any questions? That was the last one I had. Give folks an opportunity here. Ah, hold on a second. I'm sorry, sure. Debbie. Oh. Who would write such a rule to prevent this? Okay. So uh, if, the, if the vulnerability is g generic to OPC, and I missed that part of the last part of the question. Is question. Uh, if it's generic to OPC, then it belongs in a, uh, a generic security layer. Okay. You should get that from your vendor, mm -hmm. from the vendor of your security uh, solution. If it is a more specific thing like a machine can't be run safely over 8,000 RPM, for instance. That rule is going to be written by the vendor of the machine. And that is why I keep stressing that you know, industry needs a, an open framework, such as Peloton or some of the other things that are being talked about, right? such that uh, uh, a, a, a capital goods provider or a, a security vendor or the open source community, okay, mm -hmm. think about snort rules. Mm -hmm. right. The same way people write snort rules to solve problems like this, this kind of vulnerability could be solved by an open community, and they just need a language uh, that can be enforced by, by, by machine gateways, uh, network gateways, network devices, uh, filtering the network communications. They obviously need to know about the machine types. They need to know about all the different protocols. They need to be extensible because protocols are not standardized. There's hundreds of different SCADA protocols, and in many, many cases, uh, like you think about a protocol like Ethernet IP, it has elements inside of the protocol that are vendor specific. Okay, so you need frameworks to be able to to work with the uh, semantics of the communications that way too. So there's a lot of layers to it, all right? But I, I think that uh, you know we worked through uh, most of the requirements 
um, and there's pretty good answers as to who would provide, uh, who would actually solve, who would actually write the rules to solve these different problems. And I, just to the, my final point on this is multi-level. As long as you have a framework that can stack up different layers of controls and implement them and sync them and conflict resolve them automatically, you know, using a mathematical process, then you can get there. Awesome. Very good. Thank you, Francis. Appreciate it. Any other closing thoughts before I close uh, I think this we're, out? We're just at, at one hour. So I, thank you for, for your attention, everyone. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a good day. Francis, I'd like to thank you so much for the information that you provided and the Bayshore Network solutions that you highlighted uh, on today's call. We invite uh, everyone to stay involved uh, in the conversation. If you're not yet an ISAC member, you can learn more and register to become a member at uh, ics-isac.org. You can also find us on Twitter and LinkedIn, or you can drop us a note at info at ics-isac.org. On behalf of all of us at the ICS ISAC, we appreciate your joining us today. We hope that you found the information of value and something that you can take to further enhance your organization's cybersecurity posture. Other sessions will be announced in our monthly updates, on the center's website, and in our other communication vehicles. As a reminder, a recording of this session will be available on the ICS ISAC briefing archive page. Thank you all again for your participation on today's call.